Okay. So this was just the right paper. Up. This was the paper we wanted to do. Um, it was the 27, 2050 November paper. You only done, ha didn't have to do all the questions, just some of the questions. So first question here, the DNA of different species only differs in, okay, so this is important. You've got to remember that it differs in the sequence of the nucleotides. Um, there's there's always the same nucleotides, A, C's, T's, and G's, in, in a specific sequence that repeat themselves. And um, that sequence determines the, the genetic code of any species. So we all have, no matter what species we are, uh, we all have A, C's, T's, and G's, but the sequence of the A, C's, T's, and G's determines the code. It's like the letters of the alphabet, uh, the nucleotides, the sequence of the nucleotides determines the codes of the proteins that determines who you are. So for 1.1.3, it was B. Then 1.1.4. One strand of DNA molecule has 60 adenine. Okay, so one strand. Remember, it's a double strand. So there's two strands. So one strand contains 60 adenines. And then the other strand, uh, the same strand has 20 thymines. And then how many adenine molecules are present in the double stranded in both strands? Remember, A connects to T, and uh, T to A, and C to G, and G to C. So if on one strand I've got 60 adenines and 20 thymines, on the other strand I need 60 adenine, I need uh, the adenine. 20 adenines and 60 thymines. So in total, the amount of adenines I'm going to have is 60 plus 20 because there's 60 on the one strand and 20 on the other strand. So the correct answer is C, which is 80. So in, in the full DNA molecule, the double-stranded DNA molecule, I've got 80 adenine molecules. Okay, so next question, the diagram below shows, and this relates to what you did at the beginning of the year, and it's also an investigative question. Um, the diagram below shows the effect of three different types of antibiotic, X, Y, and Z, in a single strand of bacteria and grain on an agar nutrient jelly in a petri dish. The three circles indicate the distance to where each antibiotic has spread. Then they ask you, which antibiotic, the correct order of, of the antibiotic from most effective to least effective? Okay, so you've got to take a look at which antibiotic killed the most bacteria. So which one has the least amount of bacteria? And the least amount of bacteria is firstly Z, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then you go to X and you can see X has a bit more and Y has a bit more. So it's got to be Z and then X and then Y. So Z, X, and Y. So nothing that you had to know, you just had to interpret that question. Then, next question is also an investigative question. So it's important to remember with investigative questions, um, what is a conclusion? What is a theory? What is a hypothesis? What is a law? What is the aim? What would be the question of the investigation? And of course, you know that uh, an hypothesis is a prediction on the results. It's what I think the results are going to be. So let's read the question. In the most stable freshwater environment, populations of Daphnia are almost, almost entirely female and reproduce asexually. However, males are observed in low oxygen environments, so when the conditions are unfavorable, or when food is scarce, so conditions are unfavorable. Based on these observations, the researchers suggest that the start of the experiment that he suggests, that gives you a clue to what this is, he suggests that at the start of the experiment that male Daphnia only develop in response to unfavorable um, environmental conditions. This is an example of an hypothesis because he suggests what he thinks the answer is going to be. 
Okay, so it's an hypothesis. He hasn't seen results yet, so it's not a conclusion. He hasn't proven his results yet, so it's not a theory. It's an hypothesis. It's a prediction. Then, um, I didn't go into too much detail with this yet, um, but we'll cover it when we get to protein synthesis, but let's, and when we get to meiosis and those things. But it's uh, uh, and genetics, but it's already relating because we're busy with DNA. So I'm going to go through these words with you because they are going to be very important later in the year. 1.2.1 chromosomes that carry the same set of genes. Okay, chromosomes that carry the same set of genes, and you're going to see it in my hosts, is called homologous chromosomes. Homologous. And there's a specific reason I want to go through that word, homo. I'm just going to write it here for the moment. Homo, meaning the same. Logos. Homo logos chromosomes. And homo says to me the same logic. Okay, homo logos. So when we get a replicated chromosome, like we were talking about yesterday, whatever is coding inside over here is going to code for that side over there. And we even have a double one. They double up in my hosts. And you're going to see when they lie in metaphase, the two that are across from one another are going to code for the same thing. So we call the homo the same, logos, logic, coding for the same thing. Then the second one I asked here, two or more alternative forms of a gene that are with the same locus is called an allele, an allele. Okay, an allele, you haven't heard the word yet before, but let me explain the word quickly. So if we take a look at that chromosome, for example, and let's say one of these chromosomes come from daddy and one come from mommy, what's going to happen is that, for example, over here, that there's going to be a gene over there, and that gene might code for eye color. But over here, this gene also codes for eye color. But now this eye color is blue and that one is brown. So those are called alleles. alleles. The one code for the one eye color and the one other one code for the other eye color. So they both go for eye color, but it's different types of eye color. It's brown or blue. Okay, so that's called an allele. Allele. Okay. Now. People, then I asked you 3.1.3.1. Produce the first x ray pictures of DNA. Now, be careful, but the moment we hear the structure of DNA, we think Watson and Crick. And that's fine. They came up with the theory, but they weren't the ones that produced the x ray picture. Who produced the x ray picture? It was Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin. So this answer is B only. B only, please. Now let's go to 3.1 now. Question 3.1. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, again, this relates to what you did at the beginning of the year, but now also relates to RNA and DNA, which you're doing at the moment. Um, so, read the extract below. The recent Ebola outbreak has international medical organizations on high alert. The Ebola virus is deadly because it uh, causes uncontrolled bleeding. The virus, so we know it's a virus, okay, is only spread through direct contact with body tissue. This is our ever concern to uh, whatever the Ebola virus could mutate. Mutations is going to, so we're going to learn about mutations in the next few lessons. Thereby enabling it to be transmitted through the air, it happens. Um, if this happens, the virus would spread more easily. The virus contains RNA only. That's going to be a, a trick here when we read the question. And when RNA is copied, many more mistakes. So many mistakes happen. So these mistakes are called, ladies and gentlemen, mutations. Mutations. And why does why does RNA mutate more easily than DNA? Because it doesn't have a second strand to control uh, its code to replicate it properly. So that's why it mutates properly. So it mutates more easily than DNA. The Ebola virus, therefore, the, displays high mutation rates that generate lots of genetic variation, which helps evolution. Okay, so let me scroll back up. Sorry about that. 
Okay, so statewide viruses that contain only RNA show more genetic variation than viruses containing DNA um, because they make more mistakes when they are when RNA is copied. DNA doesn't make as many mistakes when copied because the replication process is a lot more secure because you have two strands that are complementary instead of just one strand that has to copy itself. Then use one example from the extract above to explain how mutations could increase the survival rate of the virus. The more mutations there are, uh, the better, the more variation there is. The more variation there is, that means that it's going to survive a lot easier as a population because there's variation in the population. Let me just make this a bit smaller here now. Uh, zoom out. Yeah, okay. Then the questions below are based on nucleic acids, so DNA or RNA, DNA or RNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid or ribose nucleic acid. Calculate key structural differences between DNA and RNA. So let's take a look. DNA has got two strands. We're going to go into that in more detail today, with RNA being a single strand. Um, so DNA is paired, RNA is not. DNA has got a helix shape, RNA has got a straight shape. Um, DNA has got one of its nitrogen bases of thymine, and in RNA, you're going to see instead of thymine, we have uracil. We're going to see that today in today's lesson. And then DNA contains deoxyribose sugars, while RNA contains ribose sugars. And then DNA tends to be a long molecule, and RNA tends to be shorter. Second question, state two uses of DNA profiling that we talked about yesterday. Okay, so we can solve crimes, we can use it in criminal investigations, we can identify organisms from their tissues, we can identify family relationship, find missing persons, find missing family, uh, uh, prove paternity, we can test specific allows that can cause genetic disorders, we can establish matching tissues for organ transplants, and we can use it for research and variation of populations. And then give two views against the use of DNA profiling. Okay, so we mentioned many yesterday. Here they mentioned just a few. Samples containing DNA can be planted. Human error can occur in the profiling process. It's a costly procedure, so it excludes some people from doing it. It's invasive uh, of privacy, and it can lead to discrimination. Then, an investigation was done by grade 12 learners to determine which chickens grow faster. Chickens, now this is not, this. you don't need to know anything about chickens. This is just an investigative question. Uh, they determine which chickens grow faster, chickens that are selectively bred or laying eggs, uh, or chickens that are selectively bred for meat production. So this has to do with selective um, se uh, human selection that we do. And this relates to a topic we're going to do at the end of the year on evolution, um, where we do, uh, discuss selective breeding or, or natural selection and artificial selection. So then they say the following steps were carried out. The learners brought 30 one-day old chickens from the commercial supply. 15 of these chickens have been selectively bred for, uh, to, um, for laying eggs, and 15 of them for, have been selectively bred for meat production. All the chickens were kept under the same conditions. So those are my controlled variables, the same conditions, controlled variables, to ensure that my um, this is a reliable investigation. Reliability, that's why we have controlled variables. This included being fed the same chicken feed, so that's one controlled variable made mostly of cereal grains and protein sources. The chickens were weighed, regularly for a period of 45 days. And I give you the results there. And you can see the chickens that were selectively bred for meat production grow a lot quicker than those that are bred to produce eggs. So formulate an hypothesis for this investigation. So ladies and gentlemen, the, um, the, we can say either that the meat or egg chickens will grow faster than the egg or meat chickens. Um, so that means that it doesn't matter which way you go, it's going to be right because it's only an hypothesis. It's before you see this, uh, this table that you set an hypothesis. So we're going to say either the egg 
nine months the uh, the the bait for egg laying are going to grow faster, or the months for meat are going to grow faster. That doesn't matter which way around you go, uh, or that there will be no difference between the growth of the two. Then state the independent variable of the investigation. What am I? What am I actually? Independent variable. What am I uh, controlling? I control actually. They say here yeah, the age of the chicken. It's not quite right according to the table. It's the age of the chicken, but it also then is the, the type of chicken. What is the chicken bred for? That is the independent variable. Calculate the percentage weight increase of the chickens that are selectively bred for meat between day eight and day forty-five. Show all workings. So you you read from day forty-five. 2,500 grams, and then you read that 500 grams, 2,500 minus 500 grams should give you 2,000 grams. Um, but you need to calculate the percentage, so you need to take the 2,500 times minus the two, uh, 500, so you 2,000, you divide it by what you started with, the 500, you times it by 100, and the increase was 400%. And the state one advantage of repeating this investigation with 100 chickens, it increases the, re uh, the reliability. We increase the reliability, not the validity, the reliability in that case, if we increase the sample size. State three factors that the learners should keep constant in this investigation. Okay, same amount of food, same amount of time that you use when you weigh them, uh, same scale when you're using the chickens, same conditions that you keep them under, you keep them under the same temperature, you keep them under the same amount of sunlight or light, and you give them the same amount of water and the same amount of food. And that increases the validity of my investigation. And then write a suitable conclusion for this investigation. Uh, the chickens that underwent selective breeding for meat production grew faster, and then chickens that breed for a claim, and that's your conclusion because then you knew the answer. And then, then this next one, um, I asked you guys, I placed this um, a new paper for you under lesson four, and I just asked you to do this one question. The diagram shows the techniques used in paternity testing. Okay, so there's the mommy and child, and again, what we're going to do here is we're going to identify the daddy. I'm not going to, going to go through the questions yet. Let's just finish the diagram and then. We'll do that afterwards. So if it doesn't match mommy, it needs to match daddy. So there's a match to male two and male three. That one matches mommy, so I'm not going to go and worry about that one. That one matches mommy, I'm not going to worry about going into that one. This one doesn't match mommy, so it matches male two and matches male three. Okay, so there's two matches for male three now, one match for male one, one match for male two. Then we go to the next one. Doesn't match mommy, it needs to match, okay, male two and male three. So most likely, if we take a look at the number of matches, male three is going to be the daddy. Then it also identify the techniques on the map. Of course, it is DNA profiling. Be careful of using the word DNA fingerprinting. Which male is the biological father of the child? Male 3. Explain your answer to question 3.3.2. When, when the child's DNA did not match the mom, it matched male 3 the most. And then state the two other uses of this technique. Um, we can use this um, we can use this technique for many things to investigate crimes, identify organisms from their remains, identify family relationships other than paternity, uh, to test the presence of specific alleles, and also to establish matching tissues from all organ transplants. Okay, so those are the DNA questions you had to go through so far. Let's take a look at. Let's take a look at DNA and RNA, uh, at RNA, sorry, at RNA today. Okay, so we went through DNA previously. Now we're going to go through RNA in a bit more detail. What do we need to know about RNA according to Kat? We need to know where do we find RNA. We're going to find RNA in the DNA, in the cytoplasm, um, and but there's specific types of DNA. And where are we going to find the specific types of DNA? 
So the first type of DNA called mRNA, we're going to find it in the nucleus. And then also it's going to go to the ribosome. So we're going to find it in the nucleus. Taking a message, it's called messenger RNA. That's what M stands for, messenger. Um, it takes the message from the nucleus and takes it to the ribosome. So we're going to find some of it in the cytoplasm as well. Then we've got what we call transfer RNA or tRNA. And tRNA we're going to find mainly in the cytoplasm but it's also going to go to the ribosome and bring amino acids to the ribosome. We've also got what we call rRNA, although it's not written here, and that's called ribosomal RNA only. But we not, don't focus too much on ribosomal RNA. Then RNA plays a role in protein synthesis. Structure and protein synthesis is what we're going to go through in the next lesson, and that's a very important section. And then structure of the RNA, we need to know that it's a single strand. It's not a double strand like the DNA, and it consists out of nucleotides as well. Okay, Ruan, you have a question? Oh, yes. So Sorry, sir. Um, my battery died, and I'm just taking forever to charge. Ruan, uh, if you're talking, you're still muted. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now, sir? You're not muted, but I can't hear you for some reason. Let me just see what's going on here. Let me just, sorry, I'm just going to adjust my sound very quickly to see what's going on. Just give me a few moments just to see what's going on with my sound. Um, oh, no, man. Um, I sent a message, sir. Okay, Ruan, just, um, I see you also put, uh, let somebody put something in the chat, so let me try and see what's going on there. It's messing me around today, this computer again. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, there we go. Okay, chat, in the chat. Okay, so, uh, okay, now I see your battery is giving you some problems. Okay, so I will, I will post the lesson again, don't stress about it, so if you don't get everything, okay. Okay, so uh, let's continue. Um, I'm, not, I'm just going to test my sound very quickly. Uh, sorry, but let me just play something else very quickly. Um, because I'm having some trouble with my sound on my computer today. I had a speaker plugged in earlier, and since then, I've been having some trouble. Okay, and never mind, I hope you guys can hear me. I see my microphone's moving. Guys, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat. I'll try and answer it from there, okay? People, then, each nucleotide is made of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base, okay? So again, same as with the DNA, there's a sugar, but this time it's a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose sugar, and a phosphate and a nitrogen base. There's four nitrogen bases. They are adenine, cytosine, guanine, but thymine, thymine gets replaced by uracil, uracil, and that's very important, okay? So thymine is replaced by uracil, and then stick diagram of the mRNA and tRNA molecules to illustrate the structure can and must be able to draw. Okay, so location of the RNA. So mRNA moves between the DNA, um, uh, between the nucleus and the ribosome. tRNA is found free floating inside the um, cytoplasm, but also goes to the ribosome where protein synthesis takes place. Okay, so it's a single strand, unlike the DNA, which is a double strand. It's a polymer. It, it, it makes long strings of nucleotides. Um, it's made up of monomers called nucleotides, and it contains a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose, like in DNA. It contains a phosphate group, and it contains one of four nitrogen bases, adenine or cytosine or guanine or uracil, not thymine. Thymine is only found in DNA. Formation of RNA, phosphate and sugars bond to, uh, to form a backbone. You can see there's the sugar, there's the phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, 
phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And it forms a backbone. And so that, that's how they make long strings of RNA. Okay, so each three nucleotides, like GCU over there, forms what we call a codon. That's going to be very important when we get to the um, protein synthesis. So remember, each three nucleotides on an RNA is going to be called a codon. You can hear the word, it's code that is going to form. And each codon is going to then code for a specific amino acid. So that's going to be amino acid 1, that's going to be amino acid 2, that's going to be amino acid 3, and we're going to, um, you never have to know the amino acids, you're going to get a table when you interpret it, but just remember that each three nucleotides forms a codon, and that codon codes for a specific amino acid, like methionine or cytosine, there's quite a few of them. Okay, types of RNA, you get mRNA called messenger RNA, so it moves between the nucleus and the ribosome. It consists of a single strand of unlimited amount of nucleotides. And it forms, uh, formed in the nucleus from the DNA template. And then, so it's a, it's a copy, it's a complementary copy. Complementary copy of what happens inside the DNA, of the code in the DNA. The mRNA carries the genetic code from the DNA, leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosome, which is then the site where protein synthesis or protein production takes place. The tRNA, people, is a single strand and folded to look like a hairpin, and it's in the cytoplasm, and it's responsible for collecting amino acid. And it has, again, a complementary code that fits onto the codon of the mRNA. And because it fits complementary to the codon, we call it an anticodon. So it's complementary to the codon. So it reads the codon, codons. The tRNA carries amino acid from the cytoplasm to the ribosome. And then that, uh, you'll see when we do protein synthesis where that happens. Then rRNA is a single strand structural part of the ribosome and it plays an important role in controlling protein synthesis. So differences between DNA, uh, DNA and RNA, they asked this question just like this in the test and the exam that I gave you um, to go through last time. So DNA is double helix, RNA is a single strand. DNA contains the deoxyribose sugar, RNA contains a ribose sugar. Nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in DNA, and nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. So thymine gets replaced by uracil in RNA. Then, in DNA, because you've got two strands and the two strands are complementary, you always get base pairings, so you have equal numbers of adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. But there's no such ratio. There's no such ratio in RNA because it's a single strand, so you don't need that ratio to happen. Here is just the same, um, but it gives you in a diagram form as the previous one, double-stranded versus single-stranded. Deoxyribose versus ribose, you can see one less oxygen, the oxygen's gone, that's why we call it deoxyribose, without that oxygen, so it's one less oxygen in the sugar, and then thymine, you can see over here, uh, the differences between thymine, there's thymine, it's got a CH3 over there, but uracil only has an H instead of a CH3. Okay, and that, guys, is RNA, very briefly. Next time, um, we're going to do protein synthesis, and that's why you need to go for RNA first, but there's not enough time to go through RNA and protein synthesis. So, guys, next time, protein synthesis that we're going to go through. I'm going to quickly check in the chat box. Let's take a look if there's any questions in the chat box. Okay, no questions in the chat box, guys. Can you guys just add some questions in the chat box? I'm going to stay on for about two minutes. Do we need to know the timeline? No, you don't need to know the timeline. I, I, I'll be talking about the DNA discovery timeline. Uh, no, uh, normally they only ask the names 
And the only names that you really need to remember is uh, Watson and Creek, Franklin, and what, what's his face? I can't even remember his name now. The guy that showed the picture to Watson and Franklin. Uh, so those are the important names. And no, the timeline is not that important. They never ask you, tell me the discovery at this date or at that date. That never happened. Okay, any other questions, guys? Okay, are the bases of DNA held together by weak hydrogen bonds? Yes, but be careful. Um, if you take a look at the DNA strand, and then you have sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And then where you have the nitrogenous bases going to the middle, that is where this, between the two strands, those are where the hydrogen bonds are. So yes, they're held together by weak hydrogen bonds. There's two hydrogen bonds between thymine and adenine, and there's three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cyanine. Okay, any other questions? Sorry that so, I can't hear the sound. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure out what's going on tonight with my computer with the sound. Latobu, you're welcome to raise your hand. I still can't hear you. Okay. So if you have something, you can also then put it in the chat again. I see that you did put two questions in the chat. Okay, I see that you are typing. Okay, do we need to, yes, you do need to know guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine, yes. You do need to know the names, the full names of the bases. Okay, it's important to know them. You usually only write T's, C's, A and G's when you're working out the, the things, but yes, you must know thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, uracil. You must know them, the names. And be able to spell them correctly, please especially in the short questions, because then that spelling is going to be important. Uh, luckily, there's no other words that sound similar to them or much similar to them. Uh, so it's, not, it's um, not so easy to confuse them. No, you do not need to know the structure of the bases. The only reason I showed you the structure of the bases is for the simple reason that I need you to see that there's a difference between, um, sorry, there's a difference between um, thymine and uh, thymine and uracil and that there's a difference between uh, the deoxyribose sugar and the ribose sugar but as for the structure you do not need to know that structure it's not important to the work that you need to know for uh, for life science okay. um, Sugar is usually a polygon phosphate, a sugar, uh, no, you don't need to know that. Uh, so you're asking uh, as an example, no, you don't need to know. Uh, it is always a pentose sugar, just so you know. It's always a pentose sugar, but no, it's not important for you to remember that. Um, we are going to do protein synthesis in the next lesson. So yes, protein synthesis is very important. We're doing protein synthesis in the next lesson. Are we going to go into depth with mRNA or tRNA? No, uh, you have to identify the basic structure of DNA, uh, of mRNA and tRNA. So for example, if you see that hairpin over here, you must know that that, that is tRNA. But no, there's no specifics on the structure that you need to know. You just need to know that it looks like a hairpin and it's got the anticodon over there and that the messenger RNA is a long string. It's not pulled up into a hip and like the tRNA. 
So that's basically how much detail you have to know, uh, but there's not much detail you need to know about the, the structure of mRNA and tRNA. That's not going to be important. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. I will then see you tomorrow. I'll post this lesson hopefully um, tomorrow early. Um, I'll post this lesson and some more work. And then we'll have a lesson tomorrow, and I'll have some practice questions on protein synthesis. Then we're not going to have a lesson on Thursday because it's a public holiday. And what we'll do is then we'll give you some practice questions that we'll then discuss on Monday when you guys are then back. Okay. Thank you, guys. If you have any questions, again, feel free to, to WhatsApp me um, the questions as well, and then we can go through it in the next lesson. Bye, guys.